Good evening. My name is C.S. Lewis, but do feel free to call me Jack. Most of my friends do. You're thinking exactly what the poet T.S. Eliot said to me when he first met me. Mr. Lewis, you appear much older than your published photographs would lead me to believe. <laughs> One felt like replying, Mr. Eliot, you appear more lucid than your published poems would lead me to believe. <laughs> so this author in vain then boarded a plane and flew to a land far away. But in this new land, his writing seemed grand. Thank God for the US of A. <laughs> you Americans drink iced tea, don't you? <laughs> How strange. Why would you put perfectly good tea in ice cold water? Still, I suppose that dates back to your first big tea party, doesn't it? <laughs> SPB stands for small piggy bottom. So I think you can deduce what BPB stands for. <laughs> Here lies Warney, brother dear, who couldn't say no to a glass of beer. Here lies Warney, soldier brave, who beat his brother to this grave. Here lies Warney, he'll ne'er be forgotten. Not with a name like Big Piggy Bottom. <laughs> Mind you, I'd hate to think what Warney would put on my gravestone if I went first. Knowing Warney, it would be short and to the point. Here lies Jack, he won't be back. Thank God for that. <laughs> I heard a voice that cried, Balder the Beautiful is dead. Dead. And he was an exhibitionist. One day he walked into my tutorial wearing an outrageous pair of slippers. There was a pig's head on each foot. <laughs> I started my tutorial and I'd only been going a few minutes when he crossed one leg over the other and began to swing the cross-legged rather provocatively. <laughs> and then he said, Mr. Lewis, I hope you don't mind these slippers. And I replied that I would mind them very much if they were on my feet, but on yours, I said, they look very appropriate. <laughs> I never saw him wear those slippers again. When I got into that sidecar, I did not believe that Christ was God. When I got out an hour and a half later at Whipsnade Zoo, I did. <laughs> I remember one day debating a man who called himself a relativist. And he concluded his opening remarks with these words. The world does not exist. England does not exist. Oxford does not exist. And I am quite sure I do not exist. And I was asked to reply. So I got up and said, how could I possibly reply to a man who's not there? <laughs> My wife was a little more blunt. Jack, she once said, the way you and your Oxford cronies sometimes pontificate, anyone would think that if you were all drowned at sea, the whole world would grind to a halt. My sympathy would lay with the fish. <laughs> So seeing this as a marvellous opportunity to, him, to embarrass him in front of his colleagues, she marched up to him and said, Mr. Churchill, you are drunk. Yes, madam. And you are ugly. <laughs> but in the morning, I shall be sober. <laughs> it was an evening in November. As I very well remember, I was walking down the street in drunken pride. My knees were all a flutter, so I lay down in the gutter. And a pig came up and lay down by my side. As I lay there in the gutter, thinking thoughts I ought not utter, a lady passing by was heard to say, You can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses. <laughs> And the pig got up and slowly walked away. <laughs> That's when joy went on the offensive. Professor Humphreys, she said, in order to make a valued judgment about female conversation, you would have to experience it 
in an exclusive environment. To do that, you would need to change your gender. That would require you to have an operation, which I for one would oppose on the grounds that the most defective part of your anatomy, namely your mind, would remain outside the scope of the surgeon's knife. <laughs> One day, as I was going out, he said, you know what people are saying, don't you, Jack? <laughs> I said, no, Wardy, because they're not saying it to me. <laughs> he said, well, that doesn't mean they're not saying it, Jack. I said, saying what? He said, I don't know, they're not saying it to me either. <laughs> Her mind was lithe and quick and muscular as a leopard. Passion, tenderness and pain were all equally unable to disarm it. It scented the first whiff of cant or slush and then sprang and knocked you over before you knew what was happening. I soon learned not to talk rot to her. Joy, I said, do you remember the, the other day you said you wished husbands grew on trees, but with your luck you'd probably pick one that was rotten to the core? She said, yes, I remember that. I said, have you ever thought about picking an overripe one? <laughs> I said, Warney, look, you're an ex-soldier. Think of it as a tactical manoeuvre to outflank the British government. <laughs> Jack, he said, as an ex-soldier, let me tell you that what you call a tactical manoeuvre, we used to call a suicide mission. <laughs> he said, don't you get the joke? I said, what joke? She said, well, here we are, the neighbours, thinking we're unmarried and up to all sorts of things, when all the time we're married and up to nothing at all. <laughs> I just don't want to lose you. In such a short time, you've become one of my best friends. She said, oh, that's very sweet of you to say that, Jack. But she said, you've got lots of friends. You've got Tullers, you've got Hugo, and you've got Warney, of course. And before I could stop myself, I said, yes, but I'm not in love with them, Joy. She said, what did you say? I said, I'm not in love with them. I'm in love with you. So I leaned forward and kissed her full on the lips. And when I finished kissing her, I said, goodness gracious, I have not kissed a woman like that in over 30 years. I can tell, she said. <laughs> and that was when we found out how cruel life can be. The x-rays revealed that she had been recaptured by the giant, and just when it seemed that she had passed through every gate and was almost out of sight of his castle. I was with her when she died. And I began to see I was looking at things from the wrong perspective. When I married Joy, I expected to have only weeks with her, maybe months. We had been given just over three years. And it wasn't about what we hadn't been given, but what we had been given. And he was the giver and she was the gift. And what a gift. What was she not to me? She was my mother and my daughter, my pupil and my teacher, my subject and my sovereign, and always holding all these things in solution. My trusty comrade, friend, shipmate, fellow soldier. And then she smiled, but not at me. She had turned to her eternal fountain. She had crossed her mortal barrier. Of course, one can dream. Mind you, I am told that he who looks on a plate of ham and eggs in order to lust after it has already committed breakfast in his heart. <laughs> Don't tell him I told you what I said, will you? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry BPB. <laughs> Good night.